What's happening, guys? It is a Labor Day slash Monday night scan uh, after a three-day weekend. So hopefully you guys all enjoyed, took some time off from the screens, got outside, and uh, had a great weekend. I did, and I'm hoping to enjoy the rest of the day, which it looks like it's going to be high 70s, almost 80 degrees again, uh, which is fantastic. It's nice to have these last couple uh, you know, warm days before it just starts teasing in with winter and uh, all of a sudden summer's gone. I'm not wishing it away. I hope it does stay, uh, but I know how this works. It gets really, really nice before they just like kill you with 40 degree days. So um, last week was awesome. Uh, one of the, it was my best week of the year behind January and February. It's hard to compare to January and February uh, just because as you guys know, I pretty much did my 2020 uh, p l in that month and a half alone. So uh, it's hard to compete with that. But if you take that out, it was my best uh, week of the year uh, since that time. So uh, I hope that this market keeps up. It is my market. There was huge opportunity both on the long side. We had a lot of swing longs uh, that worked out exceptionally well. Uh, and then even better shorts, uh, just some incredible unwind, some incredible opportunities on these merger plays that we've been talking about. Uh, and uh, hopefully you guys were able to participate as well. We'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. Uh, I will pick the Sunday scan winners uh, in the second segment right before I do the scan. Uh, but first and foremost, it is Labor Day. It is Labor Day sales. So if you are looking to become part of the community, now is a great time. We typically discount the uh, annuals, the annuals and bundles. We don't discount the monthlies. Uh, and uh, so if you are looking to be part of the community, now's the time. That is a better rate than we typically do throughout the year. If you need to be sold on the chat room, I'm not here to do that. Uh, you know, we provide quality every single Sunday night. As you guys see, we provide quality every single day. If you're not already, you know, understanding the value that we provide, then it's probably not a good uh, decision for you to join. Um, let's see. Uh, this week, I would say, was probably the most important week to, uh, or at least it checked in with your rules uh, whether or not you had risk management. Uh, you know, I always talk about uh, waiting th for things to exhaust, waiting th for things to break down, failed follow through momentum and all that kind of stuff. There was a lot of failed follow through momentum this week, followed by soaking, followed by absorbing. We talk about a sponge, right? Where you had the stuff move and then it slams down and it just gets absorbed. What does that tell you? It means it's not done. And if you keep on trying to find the top and the top and the top and the top and the top, guess what? You're going to run out of money. ANY. ANY, a crazy squeezer. I would have bet money that it was done at 8 and 9 and 10. But the volume and the price action did not suggest that it was. Each time it did have a little bit of a stuff move, it was immediately absorbed. It immediately held support and it never broke prior support levels. Each level that I gave in the room, it never re-broke. And any time that it retested, it immediately reclaimed right away. And so that right there tells you not to screw around with the front side. And so anybody that did step in front of it, you probably got tested on your whether or not you have good risk management. You know, so we always preach about risk management. We always talk about it, but it's very rare that it's really, really tested, right? And so you never really know if you have good risk management, if you will react and, and stop out as you should until you're actually really tested. And so this week there was probably a lot of real test and you found out the hard way or you found out uh, that you do have it, which is fantastic. And so if you did well, uh, stopping out, if you were trying to find the top on things this week, then great job because you respected the trend, you respected the, the price action. If you did not, go back, read all the warnings, read everything that we went over and understand that you do not want to fight the front side of the moves. Let everybody else be the guinea pigs. Let everybody else figure it out for you. Don't pre-exhaust. Otherwise, you're going to be so exhausted that you end up missing the actual trade itself. So, um, let's see, uh, this week, it was a, a little bit of a frustrating week 
just because, you know, I, I genuinely want people to do well. I genuinely want people to uh, trade well, learn. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's just one of those weeks where people were down huge on some of these merger plays, right? They're, they've been bag holding for months. And then all of a sudden, it, it catches this random momentum, this random outlier action. And then they're, all of a sudden, they're a pro, right? They're, they're a professional trader. I know what I'm talking about. Told you so, this and that. And look, it's great. I am all for people making a lot of money because it makes my job a lot easier. There's a lot more opportunity, and it's, we end up having months and weeks and days just like we had last week. But when you don't, when you're not honest with yourself, when you, when you will not accept other opinions, when, uh, you know, you've been down 50, 60% for months and it just so happens to come back, you have to understand that it is just the current cycle of the market. It is not because it was a good investment. It's not because you made good research. It is the current cycle of the market which is rewarding merger type plays because it's easy for people to think, oh, this could be the next X, Y, Z. People just want to feel comfortable and confident that they're in the next play. And if you tell them anything that is to the contrary, I mean, they're the pros because yes, yeah, so what? They were down 60% for months and, and you know, that was just a, you know, whatever excuse they make. But now they're up. So now they know what they're doing. They're a professional trader. They, they're going to quit their full-time job and, you know, they know everything. And, you know, all those people are going to be gone in, in, you know, a couple months anyways. But right now it's just a frustrating time because all these people don't realize what's in front of them, what they just made, how much they just made. You only need to get rich once. Get rich once and move on. Put it in a real investment, not in some type of outlier squeeze trade which you don't have any understanding of the fundamental part of these companies now um what else do i have uh a lot of people i've talked about this before as well and i'm going to hit a couple points real quick and then i'm going to get right into the questions because i don't want this to be too long um Obviously, people are always looking to be told what the next XYZ is, right? So it's very easy to be told, well, this is going to be the next SPRT, right? Makes perfect sense. Yeah. All, all, uh, everything checks boxes. Yeah, it could be. Sure. Uh, so I'm buying. And then everybody surrounds themselves with what they want to hear. The yes, yes people. Yes, yes, yes. You're right. You're right. You're right. You're right. Nobody surrounds themselves with what they need to hear because it's not what you want to hear. You only surround yourself with what you want to hear. So you're never hearing the other side. I surround myself with people that take differing opinions all the time. And it helps me not get biased in any one direction. I might be coming in with a super heavy bias. And one of my great trading buddies is like, hey, listen, I, I think you're wrong on this one because here's why. And... I think it's very important to always be challenged, especially when you have super, super high conviction, because if you are wrong, uh, then obviously, you know, if you don't behave with proper risk management, then it could be the end of your career. Uh, and then the last part of it is, you know, the, the people are very quick to, uh, it was down because of X, right? So this guy shorted it. So that's why this stock went down. But the reality of the situation is that it was a short squeeze. Everybody always ha is quick to point fingers as to why it's down. But why was it up? What if it was promoted on social media and it turned into a little bit of a squeeze, right? That's why it went up. So it's only natural for it to come back down. It's only natural after the cover comes in for it to come back down. But nobody will allow you to reason with them you know in that in that case it came down because of this person that shorted that's essentially you know even uh, btcm is a, a perfect example of that i just kind of looked up and had the the ticker and it's you know date me show shorted btcm that's why it went from 14 to 11s and down into 10s or whatever but is that really what happened or is it why, why did it go from 10 to 14 
Did we look at that reason? Did we look at why it went from 10 to $14? So nobody ever has an issue when things go up, but when they come right back down because they had no reason to go up, there's an issue. It's somebody's fault, right? So all of that, all those three reasons, the next XYZ type stock, the hear what you want and only what you want and not what you need to hear. And then, you know, the reason why it's down, these are all traits uh, or maybe like false myths, right? And it's all traits of the newer trader mentality where they're quick to reason, quick to have a scapegoat or a reason as to why it did not work. But they never actually have the real reason. And so therefore they're never going to learn. And that's why I get a little bit frustrated with some of the replies, which I am no longer replying to this. I just block and move on anybody that, uh, you know, decides that they're going to kind of fit one of these categories. Um, but just think about that. And the, the last piece of that, you know, a lot of these I warned uh, ahead of time, any BBIG and uh, APOP even, I was long. I had a nice long swing, but there comes a point where it's gone too much, too far. And it was just a short squeeze. And it just had this almost like a crutch because everybody could fit it into one of those situations. Well, this is the next one. This is the next one. This is the next one. And once that fades off, once that demand is met with supply, it's not going to work. And that's what happened. And that's why APOP ended up coming back. So I think that a lot of people, when I post these things and, and try to give people a heads up, it always comes back down to, well, just creating FUD, right? And it's a, that's a, basically a term that is created by future bag holders or bag holders, right? It's, it's, a term that's created from the AMC crowd and suggesting that, you know, people are creating fear and that's why these things are down. Uh, but really the truth is anybody that suggests that does not have proper risk management, does not have uh, any type of trading plan, does not have a process. So anytime you see that kind of stuff, run. Now, now I can see the sun coming in. I think I'm okay though. Um, I'll move back some. Let's see. Topics for today. Kind of hit upon all of those. Uh, super hot swing market was the only one I was going to, the only other thing I was going to talk about. But uh, that's, that's pretty obvious. I don't really need to go into that. Let's get right into the questions. I'll get right into the scan and we'll be uh, all set with this video. Watch all your videos. Listen carefully. Can't seem to figure out how you see the big swings come in on the daily uh, Wix, etc. You also seem to say a lot, steady buyer in the tape, uh, before these big moves, guessing the soaking, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So he's seeing a lot of the same comments prior to potential move. So basically what I look for in a daily chart before I take a swing trade is some type of transitional day, some type of day with major volume, outlier volume, but that's not enough to sell me on it. So Maybe I take a small position and maybe a lot of times it's wrong. Maybe a lot of times it doesn't turn into anything. But what I care about, what I'm looking for is what happens after that. Is that huge volume day followed up by dip absorb, dip absorb, dip absorb. But there's some type of ceiling, right? So I'm interested in anticipating a potential break through that ceiling on partial size. As it starts to base over that prior ceiling, that's when I like to start to scale into the trade. So you saw that a lot this week. You saw it a lot on uh, AEHR was an example of that. PXLW was an example of that. Uh, CEAU, uh, no, CLEU. Uh, these are all recent examples. FLGC was a, another example. But I like to see that huge transitional volume day followed up with some type of soak every single day in the tape. And that's what proves to me that the trade is right. And I'd rather be scaling on dips if the trend is holding rather than add, 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 and hoping that it breaks. I'd rather be adding higher on dips, not buying breakouts, but as it's 
turned into a new trend higher. I want to be adding when nobody else wants it, as long as the overall trend holds. And before you know it, a lot of times these things have these breakout days, just like you saw on PXLW and uh, I think it was OPGN from last week. There was a lot of great swings last week and the week before. Um, next one, any advice of the mindset difference between adding confirmation versus adding support and resistance levels? I have trouble adding to winners on confirmation because I always feel like I'm chasing leading me to missing the bigger picture move a lot of the time. So I think a lot of people are too quick to size into things. Uh, when I think about a swing trade, I'm not looking at intraday. So sometimes people PM me and they're looking at the intraday and they're freaking out because it's pulled back or something, or it's going nuts on the, uh, on a breakout. And whenever I get a little bit unsure, I always look at the daily. Where are we at within the daily move? Where are we at within this particular trend that's setting up? And is there a new trend setting up, whether it's bullish or bearish? So anytime that I'm unsure, I always try to go back to the daily chart and you know sort of figure out whether or not we're still you know, within the game plan. And if we're not, then I adjust. If we start to break out like crazy, I adjust. Just like AEHR, we had huge breakout. Sixes to nine something, right? I'm selling some. PXLW, I'm selling some. Um, and then, you know, you always need to make sure that you have some sort of uh, game plan that you stick with, because if you don't, you don't know when to be right, you don't know when to be wrong, you don't know when to add. Uh, but one thing is for sure that I've noticed is whenever you don't have enough, whenever you keep on missing your ads, you're on the right side of the move a lot of the times, right? So you never, you never have enough. And every time you're gonna add, it just doesn't pull back enough to where you were comfortable adding. And that is good information. Same thing on the short side. Sometimes when I'm shorting and I'm trying to add, I don't get a fill. Trying to add, don't get a fill. That's proof that there's competition. There's, that's proof that you're on the right side of the trade because you're not getting your fills. Somebody else is getting in front of you, getting in front, getting in front, getting in front. Um, so keep that in mind when you're trading these things. Uh, what signs do you look for to determine whether a new theme is uh, genuine or whether it could be a multi-day continuation, as we've seen with the merger names like SPRT, BBIG, NE, APOP, uh, Verse, just the hot stock of the day. So I think it was pretty clear by SPRT and uh, BBIG. Uh, there was a, also a couple more, but just the intense demand, the intense volume, it's going to start to trickle across once you have that second confirmation. And then as it starts to extend, each one's going to get less and less powerful, not necessarily intraday or over a couple couple days, but keep in mind, SPRT came out of nowhere, surprised everybody. No one was prepared for that, right? Everybody was prepared for BBIG and Annie and APOP. Everybody was sized. Everybody was, this is it. This is the next one. When that happens, when everybody's on the same page, the, the, the big SPRT moves, they're not going to happen because SPRT happened because everybody had already sold out of their size. Everybody was already, you know, uh, this is a big move. I'm, I'm taking some off. I'll keep a little bit just in case. And shorts were most aggressive because we hadn't seen it. We didn't know this was going to happen. But now with BBIG and Any and APOP and all these other ones, shorts are aware. Shorts are on edge. They're like, hey, I'm not going to do the same thing I did on SPRT. And on the flip side, everybody's like, well, I didn't have enough SPRT, so I'm going to go 2x, 5x, 10x size on BBIG, any APOP, and, you know, why not? Because if it's the next SPRT, then it's going to go nuts, and I'm going to make a bunch of money. Well, that's why a lot of people are emotional right now is because they got on the wrong side with too much too soon. They didn't pay attention to fundamentals. And they just bought a big pile of trash. So that's how I determine the difference, thinking about whether or not it's one name, one piece of news uh, that is fueling something, or if there's a sector. You know, for example, NFTs, TCAT, and all these other ones went nuts. And then we had that secondary move this past week. Uh, you know, you can start to, you start to see huge volume come into TCAT and DLPN, and then you can start to venture out to the other ones. Uh, once you see one or two and it's real volume, not just pop and drops one day, 
that's when I start to venture out and consider other uh, opportunities. All right, just curious, what is your mindset when a trade goes against you? Do you get out early or do you have strong conviction? Uh, if you have strong conviction, do you wait out for the trade to develop? So the, the, the big thing about being wrong, even if you have a starter, even if you're partial size, if you're really wrong, you know, that can still add up. So sometimes when I take a, a silly loss, it's because I've just held a, a starter position without respecting the trend. It went further than I anticipated, right? So for, for me, um, I don't scale into my losers. And if I do, it's, it's a, a, almost like a separate trade where I would react to a particular trade setting up. And if I nail it, I cover. If I don't, I cover. Uh, but for the most part, I'm only scaling into my winners. Uh, and I am only taking kind of dabbles to kind of get familiar with the tape. Sometimes you'll see me put on a little bit, put on a little bit. And if you don't understand or see the game plan ahead of time, you're like, oh, maybe just add, 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 add. That's never the case. You don't want to, you don't want to do that at all. So if you do have a couple ads and you're beyond what would be considered a, a dabble, a feeler or a, a starter entry. If it does not do what you expect, adjust, size down. That's what I always do. And I always, whenever something should have cracked and it doesn't, it held stronger than I thought. I always mention in the room, you know, consider adjusting. Make sure that you've got a game plan. Make sure that if you were expecting it to crack there, make sure you're trading your plan. Uh, so it's very important to always adjust around a core if you're trading the front side of the move. The other thing that's easier is just don't trade the front side of the move. Uh, especially if you're new. Uh, you nailed the levels this week on big short names this week, but I know uh, I want to know how long do you hold the long swing continuation setups, uh, and when do you look to scale? So the continuation plays typically, if I'm long them, I'll post. You know, I, I obviously mentioned that I'm participating in dips versus a particular risk level, things like that. If trades continue to develop, if the trend continues to build, then I typically will scale into that trade. If we have some type of transition day, some type of big gap up, whether it's a PR, uh, whether it's a high volume day, and we start to get pressure, I'll be sizing down. And then if it starts to hold, I can always re-add. But, you know, you've got to take the signs that it gives you. So if, if a trade, for example, KXIN, KXIN, a couple weeks ago, I had that as a swing trade. And it worked out great. It was kind of grinding, grinding, grinding each day, just like CLEU is currently. But the day that it had a PR just faded off all day. So there was a seller immediately off the open, and you have to recognize that, all right, it should have based. It didn't. It should have based. It didn't. So you got that transition day. You got that day with the PR. You got that basically exit move. And if it starts to consolidate and form a, a higher base, sure, I might revisit that trade, but you have to recognize that, hey, maybe this is the end of that move. Maybe this is why they were setting it up. Maybe this is why it had strength because other people knew that press release was coming. Uh, how do you narrow down your trading list when you have a million good plays on scale, uh, on scan? You see me do this every single day if you're in the room. So every single day I go down to two names, two main watches. Typically I have four, two main, two secondary, uh, and the rest I set price alerts for. So you need to answer this with what makes sense for you, your type of trade, your type of A plus type. So for me, you know, on Friday, MMAT, and I forget the other one, but I want them to be doing what I expected. Right? So I come to the market prepared. I have an eye on particular setups. I have an eye on particular names. And if they do as I expected, those are my focus names because that means I have a good read on them. And if they're not, then I still set price alerts and I stay familiar with them. But they're all secondary watches. It is so important to take down your watch list to two to three main names. And that's it. And you're going to do a lot better. I see so many people doing the micro scalps and all that kind of stuff. That's all great. But over time, you'll realize that that's not the way. And 
I think that, uh, you know, if you spend any amount of time in the room, you see me do it every single morning, 8.50 a.m. on the broadcast. We go from a bunch to just a few. And for me, the decision is volume, liquidity, and opportunity. You know, how massive is that opportunity? So, you know, you'll see that my main watches are always focused around the volume. I don't want to trade low float type stuff. I don't want to be part of a, a trade that, you know, one individual can, can change it. Uh, one newsletter can alert it, you know, anything like that. I want to trade real volume, real liquidity. Um, all right, last two. Uh, also, you say uh, to short pops that fail. This confuses me. If uh, I want to see it fail, I'm hitting weakness instead of the pop. I just short a pop and sometimes it keeps going higher. How do you uh, short a failed pop? So the, the difference between just chasing down short, which is fine if for me, if, if I'm going to chase it, it's going to be chase size. It's going to be a little bit smaller than I typically would trade. But when I am shorting pops, it's not a, a trend that's popping up. Think about it like this. It's got to be in a downtrend. Draw that line if you need to. And as long as it's popping up, staying under that trend line, then that pop is a better entry than just chasing it into the weakness. Because a lot of times I see a lot of people get too emotional chasing into weakness, covered into the pop. So think about where the trade stops going down, where it starts to you know, trend reversal. And as long as it doesn't do that, pops against that line is where my interest is. Last but not least, when you mention a major exchange coming soon, how do you anticipate that? It's fascinating how accurate that always seems to be. So, you know, for example, BTCM on Friday, you start to watch key levels on particular names. And so the major exchange, uh, for those of you guys that don't know, I'm referring to you know, sort of that blowout candle, that blowout moment, that big exchange of, well, player A now just gave it to player B. And, you know, they're done with the trade. And a lot of times, you know, there is just maybe a couple main players in these particular trades. And at some point, they are going to move on. So I'm looking for that move on candle, that, that candle where they're done with the trade. They're, they've exhausted out the rest of their shares. They've exhausted out shorts to the point where they say, screw it, I'm out. And you see all this emotional, like, uh, exit. And that's not enough for me in this market. I see it, I take note of it, and then I look for it to continue to fail to follow through. Knowing what I just saw likely is going to create a ceiling for the next short while. Right? I want to know that there's a lot of inventory up here versus trying to figure it out, trying to figure it out, trying to figure it out. You don't know on some of these if there's going to be any inventory. There might not be any sellers. Then you go into a circuit halt, circuit halt, circuit halt. I'd rather know that there's going to be a ceiling. And the way that you know that there's going to be a ceiling is that it comes into a particular level, keeps on having a top, a top, a top. A lot of times you'll see them pull that top off. We talk about the goalie pull, right? Pull it off. Everybody freaks out. Huge volume bars slams right back down. I want to see that, but that's not enough. I want to see it fail and fail and fail after that. Everybody always slams in before it. Anybody, everybody always slams in right when it happens. Everybody always slams in right when it, right after it happens. And they know that. And those have been becoming traps lately. So I want to see it confirmed. Fail to follow through. Let dip buyers become pop sellers. Those pop sellers are going to help your risk. It's going to be inventory on the offers so that in the event that things change, you'll still be able to get out rather than some type of thin tape. So that's it. We'll get right into a regular video scan. I will pick the winner for the t-shirt this week and uh, we'll get right to it. All right, guys. So for the second part of scan, this is where I go over my game plans. Once again, I am not a financial advisor. These are not buy or sell recommendations. This is for educational and informational purposes only. So if you're not okay with that, shut it off. If you're okay with that and you want to learn you know, sort of how I prepare for these particular trades, how I prepare for the uh, days to come, the weeks to come, then by all means, watch it. Uh, but if you want to be told what to buy or sell, not here, not happening, not what we do. Um, all right. So, uh, like I said, Chris uh, Mingachi, 
you've got the free t-shirt this week so just email me webmaster at investors and we'll get that out to you first and foremost lcid this thing had the big unwind with the share unlock and you know complete capitulation off the open and it has since come back so these are the types of trades where people look at it and they say oh well it was just you know 16 bucks and it's already 20 bucks it, it can't go much higher can it and then it does it ends up kind of squeezing everybody out that tries to find the top so you know this reminds me a lot of Sava I'm not saying that it's going to 100 at all don't think that but you can see how these huge unwinds were met with these huge squeeze back outs right and so I want to go in with that thought process that maybe this goes a little bit more than you think. And then once it goes a little bit more than even you think there, that's when it's going to be a good entry. So if I were to just kind of come prepared, I would want to see this almost come back. I would want to go back and retest where this prior resistance was. So that puts us right at 20 maybe all the way back up to this level which is 2070 so i wrote on scan 20 to 2020 uh 20 to 2050s some type of blow off squeeze everybody out that was trying to you know to find the top and then look for it to fail to follow through so i think that would be a great opportunity uh i'm going to be looking to trade that a lot like mmat so for those of you guys that saw it on uh friday it was a fantastic way to end the week this was the the big one uh, and you know the goal was 620 to 650 parabolic off the open for failed fall through momentum so this is a great example of reacting to the trade where i reacted to it into the 620 630 640s into that action i posted the chart you guys saw it more than likely and it flushed out so this is where i am a reactive trader i reacted to the action and i proactively covered around the core because i don't know if it's going to hold trend and continue to go but i am good at anticipating range i am good at being able to react to that action but if i turn that trade into a big picture trade then there's a chance that i get squeezed out because i'm trying to for, i'm forcing my bias on something that we don't know how it's going to trade yet so i can react to the action and i know that there's going to be an emotional kind of roller coaster move there but until it fails to follow through again, I don't want to be patient with the trade. So I reacted to it, covered most into the flush as I wrote, and then I rescaled in. And you can see that it exhausted out, exhausted out, exhausted out, and then finally came in. And so now I had a little bit of a padding to react and scale into the trade. That's what I'd be looking for on something like LCID, where I want to see it open up strong, squeeze everybody out. We'll probably have a nice opportunity for 50 to 70 cents but we don't know if it's going to catch and continue on for the day or catch and stay heavy so that's where you want to be cautious and that's the difference between you know more of a reactive scalp trade and then the bigger picture trade a little bit later on hot hot was a nice uh, breakout pretty steady uh, buyer throughout the day in this uh in this trend beautiful chart breakout there's no reason for it to be uh, a short uh per se however if it gaps up and it has a parabolic move 11 50 12 i'm interested in participating in that extension for it to come back and consolidate at which point i would move on i'm not looking to think that this has to pull back this could continue on to, to 20 for all i know but there should be based on the 30 million volume highest volume day in quite some time there should be a nice opportunity for me here to react to if it pops up high enough if not and it consolidates in bases at 1020s i'm interested in a continued breakout mmat higher the better ideally it gaps into the prior resistance so the prior resistance would be into the uh, 550s to 580s range would be ideal unlikely but ideal so you get the 550s here draw a line whoops draw a line right across this prior area of resistance and then into the 580 range would be you know right into this area over here um maybe a little bit higher so ideally 550 to 580s blow off and then it starts to sit back be cautious of a trade like this where it might just consolidate so you know you might nail a good trade and then you start to kind of try to force the trade but it's just going to consolidate for a few days we had that with dlpn and tcat the key is to not take them off of radar because as you saw 
TCAT produced an amazing trade. Same thing with ALF and a few others. A lot of times they have their you know, back and forth, ping pong style choppy days. You get chopped up, you take it off radar, then the move happens. So the key with this one is gonna be, don't take it off radar come Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and you'll probably have a pretty nice trade setting up. APOP, higher the better, this was fantastic. Uh, no better way to end the day than MMAT and APOP. APOP, uh, as you guys saw, I ended up exiting the swing trade, and I went short pre-market, gave all the key levels, and once again, like we talked about in the questions before, the, the transition, there was a lot of uh, failed follow through momentum and a huge transition of shares, which was not enough for me to say, all right, I'm going, you know, full size, but it was enough for me to dabble in, scale in, scale in, scale in as each level continued to fail. So had a nice padding going into the open. I was okay with a 50 to 70 cent, you know, kind of knee jerk reaction off the open. Uh, but, you know, fortunately based on what we talked about, everybody wanted it to be the next any, everybody wanted it to be the next BBIG, everybody wanted it to be the next SPRT, and the more people that are on that side and fit those three things that we went over, the better the unwind is going to be, and it was fantastic. So the higher the better. Uh, hopefully this weekend was good for stock twits, and they, they will talk about why this is going to go to 100, and it'll give us a, a 40 cent gap and potential more failed follow through. Any higher the better. Uh, I think we'll still have pressure here. Uh, a, a big warning trade. Uh, the writing was on the wall. This is a know what you own situation. They amended the filing the day before. The risk is they don't raise. So, you know, it was hard to have heavy conviction to be short overnight given such range. Uh, I personally hedged most of my position. I was short uh, after hours. And uh, I had I short the uh, the parabolic move 1080s was my confirmation level, had a great unwind, fantastic trade in the close. Then I reshorted it after hours, and I was like, you know what, I, it's such a good week. I don't want to I don't want to ruin it, and so I hedged about uh, three three quarters of my position, and um, you know obviously they raised overnight. So had I not hedged, it would have been crazy. Uh, but uh, I did, and so unfortunately, it was just a, a, a normal uh, normal trade. But uh, anyway, higher the better, and you know, you'd be surprised. This might actually continue to unwind further than you think. But there is a lot of uh, social engagement on this thing, so you have to, you, you got to take that into consideration, right? We all know how these are going to end. We all know the writing is on the wall on a lot of these trades, but... Based on the current, uh, you know, the, the, the current FOMO meter, the current uh, market uh, momentum, you have to have a little bit of a hands-off approach and let these trends kind of develop. Uh, same thing with BBIG. Like right now, BBIG, we might have another nice trade this week, but it's not a main watch. You know, something like BBIG, higher the better. And, you know, we might have a nice unwind throughout the rest of the week, but trying to figure that out off Tuesday open, trying to figure it off Wednesday open, might be a little bit more difficult, might be too choppy. So think big picture and make sure that you don't get chopped up for 20, 30 cents, 50 cents. And as long as you do that, you should be okay with, with the trade. But for me, I think there's gonna be better trades. I'm gonna let this one get off of people's radars a little bit, and then I will start to concentrate on uh, the next stage of the unwind on this particular trade. But for now, hopefully it continues to head higher. Uh, BTCM ideally comes into the 1250 mark or higher. You know, again, you can just see quite easy to look left. I think that level is about 1240. So I always say 1250.13 would be ideal. Uh, and then failed follow through momentum. You can see how clean this trade was where you had this nice stuff move right here. But this is exactly what I was talking about. The stuff moves these days are not always what they used to be. Usually you'd have that stuff move, that's it, it's done. But now you have to focus on those key levels. And until it actually breaks down those key levels, until it has that failed follow through momentum, uh, you, it, it could just be the next stage of the, the squeeze. So you can see here, huge exit, Right here, you can see the whoops. You can see the volume, 
and then it comes back up and it retests. It pulled that goalie. You can see right here, pretty strong goalie right there. All of a sudden, breaks. You can see the volume associated right here, those two days, or those two uh, one-minute candles, and then unwind from there. So that's the kind of stuff I'm looking for, and that's the stuff you have to watch out for. What used to be layup, you know, stuff, unwind, done, is now trap for 10 more minutes and then unwind. Uh, because it becomes too obvious. Everybody starts to know how to trade those names. Last but not least is DLPN. I, I kind of have DLPN associated with, uh, well, obviously TCAT. TCAT unwound nicely, but same deal as ALF. So these are the quiet ones that, you know, I don't really talk about. I'm waiting for them to kind of just do their thing quietly off of radar when nobody's looking. And uh, they've been phenomenal profit centers the last couple a uh, couple weeks. So keep those on watch for failed follow through. Continuation side of things. This is the long setups that I look for. Uh, AEHR, as you guys know, I've been swinging for uh, a little bit of time now. Um, it did come in a little bit uh, after hours, had an S3, uh, but I am going to stick with it uh, because I have a good average and also because, you know, as always, I adjusted risk accordingly. So uh, I would likely, if it starts to base the next couple days, I'd probably re-add what I sold into the 889 uh, parabolic move, but I uh, might have a little bit of pressure just from that S3 in the short term. SNMP, 120 is going to be a key level. Uh, it's been the kind of a daily chart VWAP, uh, and every time it gets there, it kind of pulls back to 110s. I'm not chasing this thing. I haven't paid over 110 for it, uh, but uh, I'm definitely interested if it starts to take out 120s as a base and then breaks 120, uh, 125, 130s. I mean, it, it's, uh, these types of trades have been going in this market, but I'm not set on it. So uh, I'd rather see it proof first. I'd rather see 30, 40, 50 million shares. Otherwise, you know, it's just an idea for this, for, for now. MTTR continues to break out. Uh, and everybody in the room knows that I uh, positioned into this. Uh, earlier in the week for a swing trade in RKLB. So far, so good. I sold uh, two-thirds of it um, on Friday. This was from the Wall Street Bets algorithm that we have in the room. I uh, picked it up pretty nicely and uh, sub, sub 11s and uh, offered a, a fantastic 30-35% move. So We'll see what happens with that. Uh, as always, I've got the staying familiar section, which has more stocks just that I am staying familiar with. I set price alerts, and that's how stocks like MMAT come on my radar. You know, they start to rebound. I start to see that steady grind, and if they don't go away, then I stay focused on them. Uh, and then when it comes time for the trade, I'm ready. I'm prepared. I'm familiar with the particular uh, setup. So. Same deal, SLQT, uh, another one that's been straight up 8 to 12. Nothing that I'm super excited about, but I'm going to set price alerts. And when and if it hits my price alerts, then I know that I have a trade potentially. So that's it. Uh, if you guys have any questions whatsoever, you know the drill. Reach out. Uh, leave a comment. Leave your key takeaway. Leave a like. Uh, and that's all you got to do. And we pick a winner each and every single week. Once again, if you're interested in becoming part of the community, uh, we've got our Labor Day sales today through, I think, tomorrow. And uh, again, if you have any questions with that, reach out cam at investorsunderground.com and uh, enjoy the rest of your day.